Good morning, and welcome to the Feast of Trumpets. Now, why are we here on a day like this? This is not the weekend, so why do we all come out here on a day like this when most people are at work, and normally we are too? Because God said there are seven annual holy days, and he tells us not to work on these days, and he wants us to have a holy convocation. To put that in modern English, he wants us to have a commanded church service. That's what that is. And so here we are. Convocation means an assembly commanded assembly. So we're here before God. Now, why does he tell us to do this year after year after year? On this particular holy day, God does not want us to forget or to misunderstand the meaning of the second coming of Jesus. People, for example, there's this preacher named Perry Stone on television. He's always talking about the holy days. I've written him a very nice two-page letter explaining to him that he didn't know what he was talking about. And I said, you don't keep them or you'd know better. Uh, and I explained to them. See, he thinks trumpets pictures a pre-trib rapture. Then he thinks the Day of Atonement pictures the Great Tribulation. No way! If a person keeps these holy days, he'll know that there's no tribulation after Christ returns. Trumpets pictures, remember, trumpets, the last trumpet, Christ returns. And if you read Revelation, when does that come? After the heavenly signs. So, so simple. When do the heavenly signs occur? After the tribulation. So if people would obey God, Psalm 111 verse 10 says they'll have a good understanding. So let's ask God's blessing because we need that. And then we're going to get right into the meaning of this very special holy day, picturing the second coming of Jesus. Eternal God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us the understanding about these holy days. And I personally thank you for each one who's here today to obey you, who have taken off from work, to, to be here, to be in church in obedience to your law who want to be Philadelphian Christians so that when the, the time comes, you can protect us because we are totally dependent upon you. We don't know what to do when that tribulation comes. Our eyes are totally on you. And we ask you now to bless us with deeper understanding today of these holy days. Inspire the teaching and the hearing in Jesus' name. And we praise you. Amen. Amen. Good to see you folks. Now, if you got your Bibles open to Leviticus 23, which maybe you already do, we're going to take a look at these seven annual holy days real quickly, and then we're going to get into the meaning of this particular day. I'll tell you something that's a little bit scary. The only people who received the Holy Spirit and became the first fruits of God's creation were those who were in a holy convocation on the day of Pentecost. Those who stayed home on that day didn't get the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wasn't poured out on everybody in Israel, just that 120 people who were in church that day. And think about all the thousands upon thousands of people that Jesus ministered to who weren't there. Wouldn't it be a, think about this, the only people who got that blessing were those who were in a holy convocation on the day of Pentecost. Wouldn't it be a scary thought to think that the only people who would be caught up in the rapture, I don't really believe this, but then again, who knows? Wouldn't it be a scary thought that the only people who will be caught up are those who are having church on that day? <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? So if Jesus does come back today, we're in holy convocation. He's not coming back today. It wouldn't be scary for us. It would just be scary for them. Well, yeah, it's scary for the ones who stayed at home and say, well, I don't have time for God. Yeah. And if you don't have time for God, you're not a Philadelphian. And the only people out of all seven churches, the only people that Jesus promises protection to out of the seven, one out of the seven, is the Philadelphian church. And he says, because you've kept my word. All right, today we're keeping God's word. And you took off from work to be here, and I appreciate it. Leviticus 23. Now, verse 3, uh, verse 2, concerning the feast of the Lord. Now, these are not Jewish. Jewish feasts for Purim, Hanukkah, and I don't know what all they do have. But these are the feasts of the Lord that he himself created. And then in verse 4, here are the feasts that you'll proclaim in their seasons. In verse 6, on the 15th day, that's the first holy day, the first day of Passover. And then verse 8 talks about the seventh day is also a holy day. And then seven weeks later, verse 15, you're to count seven Sabbaths, which there's a Sabbath at the end of every week. That means 49 days. Verse 16 says you go to the day after the 49th day, and that's the 50th. That's Pentecost. Now, Pentecost is in late May or early June. And all through the rest of June, and all through July, and all through August, and usually all the way through September, no holy days. What does that picture? Well, how long has it been from the book of Acts when the day of Pentecost occurred? How long has it been from then until the second coming of Jesus? A long time. It's been a long time. So from 
from June until September, you got 2,000 years there before the second coming of Jesus. A long time. Now, if the Feast of Trumpets had been the next week after Pentecost, that would indicate Jesus is coming back awfully soon. But instead, we got the entire summer, no holy days. And now we come to the autumn, and there are four in one 30-day period. And today's the first one. Today is the new moon. They saw the new moon in Israel. I'm glad they did last night. Uh, they're seven hours ahead of us, so they saw the new moon. It'd be about 3 o'clock our time, I think, 2 or 3 o'clock our time. So they saw the new moon put on the Internet, so we already knew early that t today would be the holy day. Now, why do we have to see the new moon? Because had they not seen it until tonight, tomorrow would be the holy day. And this is the only feast day that we're not sure about, and this day pictures the second coming of Jesus. And I'm going to tell you right now, not one of you in this room knows the exact day Jesus is coming. How will you know? You won't know till you see him in the clouds of heaven. Isn't that amazing? Now, the Jews call this New Year's Day. And they know when it's going to be years in advance. They don't even look at the new moon anymore. They just have a date on the calendar. And most of the time, they get it wrong. This year, they happen to have gotten it right by accident. But see, they don't understand what this day pictures. It pictures the day when we don't know when Jesus is coming until we see him in the clouds. You don't know when this day comes to you see the new moon. You don't know when his second coming is. Same way. All right, now let's go to verse 24. Speak to the children of Israel. And of course, you and I are now spiritually born again Israelites. In the seventh month, now that starts today. Today is the seventh new moon. The word month there, Kodesh, in Hebrew means new moon. In the seventh new moon, counting from spring, beginning in the first month, month new moon of spring. In the first day of the month shall you have a Sabbath. Now, even though it's not on a Saturday, it's still a Sabbath. A memorial of blowing of trumpets. A holy convocation, which means commanded assembly. You shall do no servile work therein. We're not to work today. Now, where it says you're an offering, offering made by fire, the only people who could do that, according to chapter 17 of Leviticus, would be the priest. Now, there are some things that you and I can do. I mean, we could blow the trumpets if we wanted to, but only the priests were actually told they had to do it. The rest of us don't have to. It wouldn't be wrong, but it would be wrong for you to make an offering made by fire. You go out here and build an altar, and you make an animal offering, you're commit committing a sin against God. You're not allowed to do that. If you don't believe it, ask uh, Uzziah, King Uzziah. Go back to Chronicles and see what happened to him. He walked into the temple. I'm going to offer up a sacrifice. And the priest said, get out of here. You're not a Levite. You're a Jew. No Jews could offer up a sacrifice, only Levites. And he got mad, so God struck him with leprosy. Don't you dare offer up an animal sacrifice <laughs> unless you know that you're a Levite and you can prove your registry to Aaron and you're between the ages of 30 and 50 and you're in Israel and you have to be in the city of Jerusalem and there has to be a temple there. And if none of that applies, don't you dare offer an animal sacrifice, okay? So, let's go back to Genesis, and I'm going to show you some interesting things today about this holy day. We're going to look at a lot of scriptures today, but it'll be worthwhile. Genesis chapter 15. You say, why are you going back there to teach us about trumpets for? Because I want to. Genesis 15. <laughs> yeah, chapter 15. Now, in chapter 15 of Genesis, God has called Abraham out of uh, Ur of the Chaldees, and in verse 13... God said to Abram, this is before he changed his name to Abraham, Know of a surety that your seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, your seed, your descendants, and shall serve them, and we know how they were in slavery to the Egyptians, and they shall afflict them, your descendants, 400 years. And that nation then I'll judge with great, great judgments. And then he tells us here in verse 16, But in the fourth generation, after they've been serving they shall come here again for the now notice for the iniquity of the amorites is not yet full what an interesting statement that is you're going to have to wait 400 years i am not going to give you and your descendants this land until their iniquity is full god is so loving so merciful so kind he wouldn't allow abraham's descendants to take away their land because there's some good people among the amorites do you know why God has not allowed World War III to start yet? Do you know why God has not allowed our enemies to take over America? There's some good folks here yet. There's some good Christians who still love Jesus in this country. And as long as there's enough good, how many, what percentage, I don't know. But as long as there's enough good people in this country, 
God's not going to allow our enemies to come in and take over. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 24, uh, verse 22, I think it is, except those days should be shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, I'll shorten the days. For our sake, he won't allow World War III to annihilate everybody in the world. It's not going to happen. It's a good thing there's some elect here. There's some Christian folks here. Or otherwise, remember what happened in Noah's day? God said, I'm going to wipe out everybody. Then he found Noah. Well, the world was so bad, he said, I'm still going to wipe them out, but I'll save you. Remember in, in Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham said, if you ask God, if you could find 10 people there, would you destroy them? God said, okay, if I find 10 people, I won't destroy them. He didn't find but one. Just Lot. You can't count his wife. His wife wasn't really that righteous. You sure can't count his daughters. So God found one guy. He needed nine more people, and they couldn't find him. So he went ahead and destroyed Sodom. But guess what? He got Lot out first. He took Lot and protected him out in the wilderness. And so when God does allow judgment to fall on this nation, <clears throat> if you're a Philadelphian Christian, just like he protected what Peter calls righteous Lot, if you're righteous before God, he'll protect you too. So it's so interesting, though. He, God tells Abram, your people cannot come in here until the fourth generation because the Amorites, their iniquity is not yet slapped full. Just yesterday, I saw on television Durham had a pride parade and I thought well it's nice they're proud of their city then I found out it was a gay pride parade that is so sickening and yet they think they should be proud of their filthiness and their abominations now I don't hate homosexuals but what they're doing is filthy and it's a sin yes sir didn't Lot's wife go out with him yeah but she yeah he was she was allowed to go out but it wasn't because she was righteous because her heart wasn't right. You know, had she stayed with Lot and done correct, then, and God tested her, don't look back. That was a test. Lot said, okay, I won't look back. Right? The, the woman said, I'm going to. Yes, ma'am. Anytime you see pride now, that's what it means. It's yeah. not just pride, it's forgiveness. Yeah, I didn't know that at first. I thought, well, you know, they're proud, of, like we're proud to be Americans. I thought that's what it was, like a patriotic day. It wasn't patriotic, it was filth. And when Americans are proud of being perverted, we are, we are facing the judgment of God. Amen. Now, some people might think, well, you're, you're being cruel. That's hate speech. No, no, no. This is the speech. If you call this hate speech, you're blaspheming God. And 2 Timothy 3 says in the last days there's going to be blasphemy. So anytime somebody calls what I'm saying hate speech, the, what I'm giving you is the word of God. Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20 says it's an abomination. Romans 1, they are worthy of death. That's not a speech. That's judgment from God. So we can call it what we want to, but God's going to wipe these people out if they don't repent. Now, we're not to hate anybody. In fact, to be totally honest with you, I feel sorry. I truly, I truly feel compassion. I do. I mean, for a man to, to not like a, a, to be only interested in another man, I know the guy's mind is sick. He needs counseling. He needs prayer. He needs psychiatric help. I don't want to. I don't want to kill the guy. I, I want to get him right with God. So I have compassion. Well, you have not, a question. It's not hate speech. The most loving thing we can do is to help them see that they need Jesus, and for us to not try and help them is hate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you are proud, if you say, "Yeah, I have a pride out here," you're not trying to help them at all. Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, when? I was just going to say that's well, homosexuality, but it's not a disease. And, no. and it's not an it to a disease and a sickness. That's yeah. not. It's a choice. Mm -hmm. and, and, and yet, the choice may be based on the fact that there's something wrong with their mind. I, well, there's demons involved, too. And I do feel sorry mm -hmm. for anybody that's in that situation, but I don't tolerate the sin. But part of their justification is they were born this way. Mm -hmm. And if God... <coughs> If so God had a problem with homosexuality, then why would he create me this way? I've yeah. heard that so many times. Yeah. And Can you yes. tell me they were reprobate? Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. so um, they're blinded. Actually, that's actually what I was going to oh, okay. say. Because it was God that gave yeah. them over and turned them over yeah. to a reprobate mind. Romans chapter 1. He gave them up to, to do those things that are not convenient, which is a polite way of saying to do those things that are wrong. And again, I do, I do have pity toward the sinners. We're all people who need the grace and mercy of God. But here's the thing. If I've got a problem, I'm going to go out in the street and wear, wear a flag and be proud of my problem. I'm going to go to my prayer closet and ask God to help me. What happened to being ashamed of your sin? Yeah. Remember what I read a few weeks ago. Jeremiah says, 
they're not ashamed, neither can they blush. They don't even blush. They get on national television and tell the world what they are. Now, I want to show you something. <clears throat> Verse um, 18, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto your seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt, that's the Nile, to the great river, that's the river Euphrates, the Kenites, here's the land you're going to get. You're going to take away from, from here are the people that are living in the promised land. You're going to get rid of them. The Kenites, the Kenizzites, uh, the, Ken, the, the Mites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephims, the Amorites. When the Amorites' iniquity is full, you're going to take their land. The Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. There's a bunch of ites in there. And God said, I'm going to give you their land. No, a lot of people say those poor American Indians, those Europeans came over and took their land away from them. No, what God did was these in American Indians were worshiping pagan gods, the great spirit and all this. And we don't know this from watching Westerns, but they were cannibals. Go back and actually study the real history of the Indians. They were cannibals. And God said, I'm not going to let them live in this land of milk and honey. I'm going to bring some Christians over here. And who came over here first? The pilgrims did. So Christians came to this country and settled it. And I've read colonial literature. They settled it as a Christian nation for the glory of God. They called this the new promised land. And God said, and God was in agreement. Go in there, go in there and take away from these American Indians who, who worship pagan gods. Go in there and take their land away. It was God's will for the Europeans to have this country because they were Christians. Now, today, we've got a lot of atheism and agnostics. Anyway, I'm getting off topic here. They were kind of, they were wanting to <coughs> escape where they were anyway. That's true. <coughs> but it's not wrong that they took their land away because you see here, God said, I'm going to let you take their land away. And God is the same today as he was yesterday. So, so the Amorites, God said, you can have their land too, but not until their iniquity is full. So God loved them so much, he wouldn't allow them to even take away their land. And God will not allow our enemies to take away our land until his judgment is really, really against us. And it's just a matter of time. I don't know when, but it's going to fall. Now, I want to go to uh, Numbers chapter 10. And I'd like for you to, if you have time, to turn over there with me. I think you've got time. Today's a day of rest. And you're here in church. Chapter 10. This is the day of trumpets. And I want to show you, in chapter 10, there are seven reasons why the trumpets should be sounded. And verse 2, make the two trumpets of silver, not the ram's horn, the shofar that you hear many times Jews blowing. Uh, and you may hear that out there today. A ram's horn is a horn, but God wanted them to make trumpets of silver, just like you see in an orchestra. Uh, <clears throat> now, the third line, number one, that you may use them for calling of the assembly, because they didn't have email, so they'd blow the trumpet. Oh, but they remember Paul said if the trumpet sounds an uncertain sound, who will know what to do? So that, just like they have revel, revelry, is that how you say it? Revelry? Revelry. In the military, and you have, you know, when they go to bed, when they Reve wake up. Revelry. Huh? Revelry? Revelry. It's revelry. That's right. Revelry is the other thing. So the silver trumpet represents a different sound. Is the reason they want well, to the trumpet they could play all the sounds. They had different. They had at least seven different musical sounds. Okay. And and just like when it, they play taps when it's time to go to bed, they blow the trumpet. Everybody knows it's time to turn off the lights. When they plays it, revel, revel, re, that revelry in the morning. I think you know to get up and get going. So Paul said, if they if it plays an uncertain sound, you won't know what to do. So they had certain sounds. Uh, number one, for the calling of the assembly. Number two, for the journeys of the camps. They knew what to do when they heard the sound. Verse four, <clears throat> they will blow the trumpet. They will blow, but with one trumpet, the princes, which are the heads of the thousands, shall gather themselves unto you. Verse five, here's number four. When they blow in a trumpet, the camps that lie on the east parts will go forward. Verse seven, when the congregation is to be gathered together, you blow a trumpet, but don't sound the alarm. You have to play, play a certain a tune. And uh, then verse 10, number 6, in the days of your gladness and in your solemn days. And number 7, in the beginnings of your months, you shall blow with the trumpets. Now, but on the day of trumpets, it was blast, blast, blast. The day of, in fact, it can be translated the day of blasting. Now, somebody said, why do you bring trumpets in here? I don't own a trumpet. Do you got, anybody here got any silver trumpets at home? Maybe that's why the Jews use the ram's horn. They're cheaper than buying silver trumpets. Besides ram's horn, you're just blowing it like a gazoo. To play a trumpet, you got to actually know how to play the thing. <laughs> so anyway, we see here at the beginnings of the months, every new moon they'd blow trumpets. But on this new moon, it was a day of blowing of trumpets. Why? Now, I had a Jewish man to tell me this. He was training in the rabbinical school. And he and I were sitting there talking. 
and uh, he taught Hebrew and everything. And he had gone to rabbinical school, but he eventually became a Christian when he saw the seven weeks prophecy, apparently. So he became a Christian, still kept the Sabbath and Holy Days. But he asked me, he said, he, he, no, he didn't ask me. He was telling me this. He said, I don't know why that they only blew trumpets the first seven new moons of the year. I said, really? Because you don't see that in the Bible. This indicates they did it all 12 months. But he said, no, they only did it the first seven. This was the seventh time, the seventh new moon, that they blew the trumpets. Revelation talks about seven trumpets, which we'll take a look at shortly here. Now, <clears throat> one more place here in, I, in Numbers 29. <laughs> Verse 1, <clears throat> in the seventh month, that's today, on the first day of the month, that's this day we're, we're looking at right now, you shall have a holy convocation. And here we are in church. You shall do no servile work. This is not the day to go to work. It is a day of blowing the trumpets. This is the day for blowing trumpets, you see. Now, <clears throat> Numbers 28, 29 primarily deal with the sacrifices connected to these days. And we, we, we can't do that anyway. We're not allowed to. Now, I'm going to read Joshua, but before I do, I'm going to flip over real quickly to Isaiah 27. There's something I want to show you in Isaiah 27. Why does God tell us to do this year after year? This is, I've been doing this now. This is my 49th year doing this. And I enjoy it. Something else about the trumpet. The last trumpet is the main trumpet of the seven. It's the great trumpet. Numbers 27, verse 12. It, Isaiah or Numbers? Isaiah. Did I say Numbers? Yeah. I apologize. Isaiah 27, verse 12. It shall come to pass. Now, in my reference Bible, right above verse 12, it says, Israel regathered. When Jesus comes back and the trumpet sounds, guess what? Israel will be regathered. Now, I've heard people today say, well, that happened back in 1948. A handful of Jews, a few thousand Jews, went to the land of Palestine, set up a Jewish state. Uh-uh, no, no, no. Israel won't be regathered until Jesus returns and the great trumpet sounds. It'll come to pass that in that day the Lord will beat off the channel of the river and the stream of Egypt. And you, you, you twelve tribes, will be gathered one by one, O children of Israel. Verse 13, it shall come to pass in that day when the trumpet sounds, that the great trumpet shall be blown and they, sh and they shall come who were ready to perish during the great tribulation in the land of Assyria, the outcast of the land of Egypt, and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount. So when Jesus comes back, all, actually 13 tribes, will be brought back into the promised land. Yes, sir. Okay. Stop the water so that they could pass? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that? Okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. He's going to beat off from the channel of the river, the stream. So they'll be able to walk <clears throat> over now, I want to go to Joshua, and I've got several. You say, why go to Joshua? Well, shouldn't we be in Revelation? Well, my Bible's falling apart, and I just glued it together. You can see this. Joshua chapter uh, 1. Why are we way back in Joshua? <clears throat> well, what do the trumpets picture? I'm going to show you. Verse 1, after the death of Moses, <clears throat> the servant of the Lord, it came to pass the Lord spoke to Joshua, and he said, Moses, my servant, is now dead. Verse 4, from the wilderness of this Lebanon to the great river, that's the Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, it's all going to be for you. Verse 5, no man will be able to stand before you, because you know Moses, his shoes were hard to fill. I will be with you. I will not fail you nor forsake you. Be strong, be of a good courage. Because you know, he was a bit, how can you fulfill, how can you take the place of Moses? Verse 7, only be strong, be very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. Have our churches done that? Yeah, they have. That thou mayest prosper wherever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You're to meditate therein day and night. Why? The last line. Then you'll have good success. You'll make your way prosperous, and you'll have good success. And verse 9, haven't I commanded you? Be strong, be of good courage. Why did God have to tell him this? Imagine if you were Joshua and Moses is the great prophet and somebody looks at you and says, well, what can you do? What can you do? You're just Joshua. You're not Moses. I mean, you'd be intimidated, wouldn't you? And so God encouraged him to do that. Um, chapter 3, verse 10. They're getting ready to come into the promised land now. In, in chapter 3, verse 10. 
Joshua said, Hereby you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. A bunch of ites in there. Why drive them out? They're heathen, they're worshiping other gods, and they're in God's land. So come to think about it, this whole earth belongs to God, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. If the people in China or Mongolia or you name some country, if, if when Jesus comes back, if they don't stop worshiping their false gods, they're going to be in trouble. Remember uh, Luke 19, verse 27. Those who don't want me to rule over them, bring them here. Slay them. That God, Listen, God is not bluffing and he's not lying. So chapter 6 of Joshua, verse 1. Now Jericho was straightly, strictly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. They were afraid of what was going to happen. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given into your hand Jericho. Now that was the first city they were to take over. Verse 3, compass, that means surround the city. All you men of war go around the city just one time. But you're to do it six days in a row. Verse 4, listen to this. The seven priests shall bear before you the ark, before the ark seven trumpets, and the seventh day you're to compass the city seven times, and then they're going to blow up the trumpets. Why did they do that? God was announcing judgment on the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Jebusites, and all those other ites. This was a warning to everybody in the land of Canaan. Now, they should have taken warning during that 40 years. Hey, did you hear what happened to Israel. Yeah, their God is a powerful God because God opened up the Red Sea and they walked across dry shot and they're coming here to take us over. They had 40 years to repent and they still didn't do it. Remember what Rahab told the spies? We heard how your God opened up the Red Sea. We heard it. How'd they hear that? Without email, without television, without newspapers. They had spies. They sent their spies out to see what was going on. They got the news. There were people during that 40 years who went across Jordan, intermingled with millions of Israelites and said, uh, what are y'all doing out here? Oh, we, we're God's people. We crossed over in the Red Sea. Really? Tell me about it. Yeah, well, what are y'all doing out here? Went around the wilderness for all these years. Well, God's going to bring us into the promised land. God's going to let us take over. They go back and tell the king, hey, those people out there, they're serving their God, the God of Abraham, and, and they told me they were coming over here to take over. They had 40 years to get it right, and they didn't do it. And all the people in the promised land had heard those Israelites were coming here to get us, and they still didn't repent. So they had time. Remember, God told Jonah, go tell Nineveh, in 40 days, I'm killing you. And the king repented, and God didn't kill him. God would not have allowed Israel to even take their land had they repented. Think about that. He's telling us now. Yeah, this is for us. And it's for all of America, and for those of you watching over the internet, it applies to every country in the world, ultimately. So, so we're in chapter 6, verse 4. There's seven trumpets announcing judgment on the land of Palestine. Verse, um, okay, verse 5, it shall come to pass when they make a long blast, the wall will fall down on that seventh day when they blow seven times. They're going to march around the city seven times. Verse 6. Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let the seven priests bear seven trumpets. Verse 8, it'll come to pass when Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets, they blew with the trumpets. Verse 9, the armed men went before them. Okay, so verse 13, and seven priests bearing seven trumpets, they blew with the trumpets, the armed men went before them, but the rear war, that means the rear guard, came up after the Ark. Verse 14, the second day they compassed the city one time. So they, the first day went around the city, went home. Second day went around the city, went home. Well, the third time the, the Israelites would come, the people in Jericho were getting ready to fight. And they turned around and go home. So seven days later, they're all sitting around at the wall. They're all sitting by the wall because that's where soldiers have to be. And they're playing cards. Yeah. Here comes those stupid Israelites again. I got a jacket. You, I got a queen. What have you got? You know, they're not paying attention now. So God got them off guard. And on the seventh day, when nobody's paying attention, the walls fall down. And guess where the wall falls? It kills the soldiers when it falls down. All Israel had to do was just walk in and take it. What did God say here? I just read it to you. I have given you the city. Now just go in there and take it. It's kind of like I have given you uh, a gift. It's on the desk. Go get it. See? It'd be the same thing. 
Verse 16, it came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew the trumpet, Joshua said, shout for the Lord has given you the city. Judgment was on the land. Now I want you to go to Jeremiah 25. We read this the other day, but we've got to read it in this context. Jeremiah 25. It's right after Isaiah. <clears throat> Because now I'm going to bring it down to our day. What's this got to do with our time in the 21st century? Jeremiah 25 and verse 15. Thus says the Lord God. Now this is in the last days. Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. Verse 17. I took the cup and I made all nations symbolically to drink the fury. Meaning that in the last days God's wrath is going to be poured out on the world. Verse 26, and all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world, would that include the federal government of the United States? Would that include Britain? Would that include Canada? The nations, the provinces of Canada, and around the world, in Asia, and so on? All the kingdoms of the world which are upon the face of the earth. So this is not just talking about way back then. Now, my footnote, and I've read this to you before, but I want to read it again. In my reference Bible, it says, the scope of this great prophecy cannot be limited to that day and time, the invasion of Nebuchadnezzar. If Jehovah does not spare his own city, should the Gentile nations imagine there's no judgment for them? Now, listen to this statement. The prophecy that we're reading leaps to the very end of this age. Now, Schofield, I've got a Schofield Bible, was a reputable scholar and is still looked upon to this day as a, as a reputable scholar. And he explains this is referring to the last days, and it does make sense. Because after all, did God punish all nations in Jeremiah's day? No. This is in the last days. So what are those seven trumpets in Revelation? It's announcing judgment on all the nations of the world. Everybody. We're in trouble. America has killed 60 million babies and the China has probably done more than that. They wait till they're born. If it's a girl, throw them in the river. They allow the boys. That's why right now there's a big problem. The guys can't find girls to marry. There's not enough girls because for the last 20, 30 years they've been killing the girls because they have such a population problem over there. China is in big trouble. They're under the judgment of God big time. But then what nation isn't? Tell me a righteous nation. Oh, well, Israel over there in the Middle East, they're righteous. Oh, yeah, do you know they have tricycle races for queers over there? Do you know Revelation says in the last days, Jerusalem will spiritually be in the last days Sodom. In the last days, even Jerusalem is Sodom, according to God. That's in Revelation. How did God know, how did John the Apostle know that 2,000 years later, that kind of junk would be going on? He didn't know, but God knew. God told John. And John wrote it down for us to read. Now, verse uh, 31 of, of this same chapter here. A noise shall come up even to the ends of the earth. That includes where we live. No matter what country you live in, that includes our nation. For the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. Asian, African, European, you name it. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked Pay attention, Americans. Pay attention, people in other countries. We have to pay attention to this. He will give them that are wicked to the sword. There's going to be a sword. We call it World War III. It's coming. Revelation talks about up to one-fourth of mankind may die during the tribulation. And then, after the tribulation, comes another period of time called the great and terrible day of the Lord. And up to, not up to, but a total of one-third of what's left will die. Do you think God's bluffing when he says I'm going to kill you if you don't repent and then you look at Egypt after Christ has returned the Egyptians are still apparently going to rebel we will not worship this Lord of hosts and verse 16 says all nations will come up to Jerusalem year after year and they're going to worship the Lord of hosts the Egyptians will say we refuse God says I'll hit you with drought to get their attention if the drought doesn't work what's the next thing do you remember Zechariah 14 what it says is going to happen plagues. God's going to heal his plagues. And people die of plagues. In Europe, what was it? Something like 25% of people died of bubonic plague in the Middle Ages. People die of plagues. And so when thousands of Egyptians start falling over dead from the plagues, they'll say, okay, okay, we'll come and worship this Lord, whoever he is. So they're not going to become righteous overnight. It's going to take a while to get their attention. Uh, God's not going to have to do that to me. I'm already paying attention. How about you? We 
need to pay attention now. So he's going to plead with all flesh. <clears throat> now verse 33, pay attention. This, this means all of us in this room, everybody watching by the internet, and the slain of the Lord shall be in that day from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. There's going to be so many that can't bury them. They'll be like dung upon the ground. You won't be able to bury them. The slain of the Lord. Jesus is not coming back to get crucified again. He's coming back to carry out his judgment. And those who shake their fist at him and refuse, they die. Zechariah 14, while they stand on their feet, their eyes will consume away in their holes, their, their tongues will consume away in their mouths. How he does that, I don't really care, but the fact of the matter is, they fall down dead right there on the spot. And then he's going to look around and say, now, do you, you want to rebel? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. That's a shame. People would rather die than worship the Lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I know they're deceived. You know, we're talking about homosexuals being deceived, but there's still judgment still on them. The reason these people are rebelling against Christ, they're deceived, but they still die. I don't want to be deceived. I want to know the truth. I want to know the truth. And you know where it is? It's right here in this old book right here. It's right here. This is the truth. It may be falling apart, but it's the truth. Burden is easy and a yoke is light. Yeah. Amen. 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 They would rather die than serve the Lord. They would rather die than serve the Lord. And it's a shame. Now, I won't ask you to turn there, but if you want to, you can write these scriptures down. In Matthew 24, 29, Jesus says, after the tribulation has terminated, it's completed, it's over and done with, then the sun goes dark, the moon goes dark, the stars fall from heaven. Theologians have a name for that. They call it the heavenly signs. Joel 2, 31, that's the second scripture. It says that... Joel 1. Joel 2, verse 31, says the sun will go dark, the moon turns to blood, it goes dark, the stars fall from heaven before the day of the Lord. Now, I've done this in class. You have the great tribulation, number one. Number two, the heavenly signs. Number three, the day of the Lord. Now, if you understand that sequence, you can't assume that the day of the Lord is the same as the tribulation. Revelation 12, 12 says the tribulation is the time of Satan's wrath, and yet... The great and terrible day of the Lord is the time of God's wrath and God's judgment. So don't, don't allow these people on television to confuse you when they try to tell you that God is judging the world during the tribulation. God ain't doing anything. God's standing back like this, watching it happen. And it's the devil who's trying to kill. There's two groups, Revelation 12, 17. There are two groups that Satan is after. One is Israel. He's trying to wipe them out. And number two it are the saints of God. He's trying to kill them. Yes, sir. If God was going to be the one that orchestrated the tribulation... Why would he want to save those that he orchestrated it against Yeah. to begin with? I've heard people say, well, Christ isn't coming back to beat up his bride. Of course not. That's the devil beating up the bride. But the right. devil's going to do it. Right. Look how many people in the bride of Christ are lukewarm today and couldn't give a flip about the word of God. You know, you, if you go to their house and say, where's your Bible? Oh, it's around here somewhere. I saw a couple of weeks ago. What do you think all these people that think that the tribulation is God's wrath or these people that believe in a pre-trib rapture and they don't think that the only people that are going to be left here are the people that God wants to punish? Well, I don't know. I'm not going to, I don't know how to answer that one. Only God knows. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not talking about God. I'm talking about these people that justify. They justify. They justify. They yeah. <laughs> We're going to enjoy that place. Gonna be Let's go to Revelation now. Let's get the gist of this thing. Revelation 6. How do we know the first five? Now, there are seven seals that seal up the book of Revelation. That's why most Christians cannot even understand the book of Revelation. It's sealed. It's sealed. But yet it's supposed to be for the Christians to understand. But yet so many Christians... Don't understand the book of Revelation because Psalm 111, verse 10, I keep going back to that. A good understanding of all they that do, not those who just read. I hear people say, well, you're blessed if you read it. Well, no, read that verse carefully in Revelation 1. You're blessed if you read and keep these things. And if you're not, if you're not obeying God, then you're not going to understand it. Okay, so Revelation chapter 6 and verse Let's look at the seven seals, verses 1 through 2. talks about the white horse. The man has a bow, not a sword. This is the Antichrist. Verse 3, we have the second seal. Verse 3, the, <clears throat> we have famine. <clears throat> verse 2 is warfare. We have famine, the third seal. The fourth seal is death, because there's a lot of people going to die during the tribulation, up to one-fourth, it says there in verse 8. And then the fifth seal, 
in verse 9 are all the saints that are going to be killed during this time who were standing by waiting for the rapture to occur because Jack Van Eppie told them it would and it didn't happen. And they're not right with God and during the tribulation they're going to have to be tested. You either get right with God and you're probably going to lose your life or you can take the mark of the beast. It's your choice. And the ones that take the mark of the beast are in serious trouble. Read Revelation 14. They'll get hit on fire. Those who don't take the mark of the beast, many of them are going to be executed, beheaded. And I get on radio and I get on television when I can be on television and I try, I preach and preach and preach, get right with God by keeping his law. Oh, no, the law is done away. And I can't, I can't make them. Uh, here's water. I'm leading them to water, but they won't drink. I got the living water right here that they won't drink. The majority. I mean, you realize I've been on radio for, for all these many, many years, and very few people take it seriously. They, they, I get preachers that say, I listen to you all the time, Keith. Don't agree with what you're saying. But I listen to you. There's any hope for anyone who takes the mark? Well, the Bible indicates they're in serious trouble. Now, verse 12 is the verse, verses 12 through 17 is what I want to come to. That's the sixth seal. And what happens? The same thing we read in Joel 2.31. The sun becomes black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. The very same words as in Joel 2.31. Verse 13, the stars fall from heaven. Again, theologians have nicknamed this the heavenly signs. That's a good name, heavenly signs. Sun goes out, that's a great sign right there that Jesus is about to come. Now, the heavenly signs, Jesus says, occurs immediately after the tribulation. The first five seals... That's the tribulation. It starts with the man on the white horse. Now, it's not Jesus. That's the Antichrist. Setting up the abomination of desolation. When that occurs, he said, then shall be great tribulation. So verses 1 through 11 deal with the great tribulation. Verse 12, the tribulation is over and done with. Now you have the heavenly science. Now the heavenly science introduces God's wrath. Verse 17 for the great day of his wrath, God's wrath, verse 16, the last line, the wrath of the Lamb, Jesus, who will be able to stand? <clears throat> the, the, this introduces the great and terrible day of the Lord, who shall in the future, when this starts, because it's going to start after the heavenly signs are finished, who will be able to stand? Chapter 7, if you have a reference Bible above verse 1, it says parenthetical. Chapter 8, it continues the chronology, the narrative. Chapter 8, verse 1 when he had opened the seventh seal, there's only seven on Revelation, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. I heard a preacher say one time, God must really be mad. Everybody's tiptoeing around heaven up there. Verse 2, and I saw seven angels, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now, we just read in the book of Joshua, there were seven priests who had seven trumpets, and when they blew those trumpets, that announced judgment on the land. And the first city was Jericho, and then they went out and got Ai, and then they got all these other cities until they conquered the entire land. It was God's judgment on the land. There are seven trumpets in the last days. God's judgment on planet Earth. Verse 6, And the seven angels which have the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound to blow with the trumpets. Now, uh, verse 7, you have the first trumpet. And I won't read all that, but a third part of the trees were burnt up. That's going to happen in the future. We know this hasn't already happened because that's never happened in the world. That's never happened in history that we know anything about. Verse uh, 8, the second angel sounded and a great, as it were a great mountain burning with fire, that sounds like an asteroid, was cast into the sea and the third part of the sea became blood. They, they, uh, if it hits the oil tankers, uh, verse 9, a third part of the ships are destroyed. If they carry oil, do you know what happens to, to seawater when oil mixes with it? Remember when that tanker down in the Gulf of Mexico, whether it's capsized or whatever, and the whole Gulf of Mexico became red like blood. Everything. Yeah. And so when, all, when a third of all the ships of the world are destroyed and that oil gets into the oceans, it's going to kill sea life, and the oceans are going to look blood red. That has never happened in history. This is still future. The third trumpet, verse 10, it sounded and a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp. It looked like a lamp. That could be another uh, asteroid or a meteor. It fell upon the third part of the rivers and the waters, and the waters became bitter, verse 11, like wormwood. They couldn't drink them. Verse 12, the fourth trumpet sounded. Now, here is, this is something different from the heavenly signs that occurred after the tribulation. 
The sun go, doesn't go dark and the moon does not become as blood, but a third of the day the sun doesn't shine. Now that's so weird, that's to get everybody's attention. If the tribulation didn't get their attention and this doesn't get their attention, they're really hard-hearted. Now you'll notice verse 13, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because there's three more trumpets yet to sound. The first four trumpets, you've only got one verse or two verses for each one. But the fifth trumpet has 11 verses connected with it. It's a woe. It's a calamity. And then the sixth trumpet is verses 13 through the end of the chapter. So here are the fifth and sixth trumpets that are so bad. Look how much it takes to explain how bad they are. But that's not the worst. The seventh trumpet is the worst of all. Now you say, wait, wait, wait. I thought the seventh trumpet was good because Jesus is coming. It's good for you. But for the unrepentant wicked, the seventh trumpet... I meant to draw this on the board, and I didn't do it. Let me draw it now. I think I've got the time to do it. You have the seven trumpets. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the seventh trumpet, do you know what that contains? There's seven bowls of wrath. The King James says vials, but the Greek says bowls. And those seven bowls is like the mixture poured out. Oh, no, I'm sorry. No, it's like wine poured out without mixture. You don't dilute it. It's strong. You know, if you take some kind of a drink and it's you don't dilute it, you just like whiskey, you just turn up like that in full strength, knock you out maybe if you're not used to it. I've never tried it, but, you know, people who have tried it say it happens. Well, the seventh trumpet is the wrath of God poured out without mixture. You got you got seven last plagues in each and watch what's a bowl it's not a cup of wrath it's a bowl what if a person drank whiskey out of a bowl it would knock you off your feet so here's the wrath of god poured out without mixture and it's not a little glass it's a bowl of wrath and there's seven of them and each one contains one of the last plagues that's why the seventh one is the worst of all now trumpet number five in chapter nine God said, this is going to be so bad. Don't let anything be heard. Verse 4, the last two lines, except those men who don't have the seal of God in their foreheads. They haven't been raptured to heaven. They're still here. And God is sealing them and protecting them from this wrath. These demons, verse 8, have the hair of women, and but yet they have, verse 7, the faces of men. So th these are fallen angels who have the faces of men, but yet they got long hair. And that's what they try to portray Jesus as, a demon. Face of a man, long hair. <clears throat> Verse 13, the sixth angel uh, blew his trumpet, and there's an army, verse 16, of 200 million. 200,000, thousand, that's 200 million. By these, verse 18, talks about all this, I won't read it all. The third part of men were killed. This is going to be a major, major war. Now, what I want to point out to you is Jesus hasn't come back yet. Well, how do we know? Paul said at the last trumpet, Jesus comes back. So here we are in the sixth trumpet, and all this is going on, and Jesus still hasn't come back yet. Chapter 10, if you've got a reference Bible above verse 1, it says that's parenthetical. In fact, all of chapter 10 is parenthetical through the first half of chapter 11, actually down through verse 13. That's all parenthetical. It's a flashback to the great tribulation of the 42 months and so on. Now, verse 15 continues the narrative. Verse 15, and then the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and the word sounded here is actually trumpeted in Greek. They, in other words, he sounded the trumpet. And there were great voices in heaven saying, now, at this point in time, right now, this is when it happens, now all the kingdoms have be, are becoming the kingdoms of our Lord God, the Father, and of his Christ. So at the seventh trumpet, guess what happens? Jesus returns in the clouds of heaven to take over all the kingdoms of the earth. Do we have a question? Yes. Okay. Is the seventh atonement the single jubilee in First Thessalonians in First Thessalonians four thirteen through sixteen? The atonement. That's why you wrote. Uh, the atonement starts the great starts the fiftieth year of jubilee, <coughs> uh, which indicates that when Jesus comes back, shortly at the time of his coming, he may come back in a jubilee, or just shortly thereafter, he may come back in a jubilee. And we know that another jubilee is coming pretty soon. We don't know the exact year. 
there have been 39 jubilees from the time of Christ. The next jubilee will be number 40, and 40 is the number of completion of trials and testing. We'll talk maybe a little bit more about that in 10 days when we have the Day of Atonement, which will be October the 9th this year on our calendar, but it's the 10th day of God's seventh month. Okay, so then uh, verse 18, the nations were angry. I guess they are angry because God's judging them. And thy wrath is come when in the trumpets, but especially the seventh trumpet. And the time of the dead, well, it's about time. They've been dead all these centuries. But now their time has come that they should be judged. You can't judge them when they're dead. You've got to resurrect them when they're dead. That th and that you should give reward unto your servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear your name. So when is the time of the dead? When is it? Their time is when Jesus comes back, the trumpet sounds, and they wake up. They wake up in the clouds of heaven. I saw a cartoon, I think it was just yesterday, people standing in line. They're walking in clouds. You know, a lot of times they show the clouds up ankle deep. And they're standing in line to talk to St. Peter to get to the pearly gates. You know, what is interesting about that is we've all seen those cartoons. What is interesting is if you die before Jesus returns, and the next moment of your consciousness, if you're a Christian, when you wake up, you are going to wake up in the clouds of heaven. Not the third heaven, our clouds, the first heaven. Because you won't wake up until Jesus returns. And then when the trumpet sounds, the dead arise. And if you're still alive, you'll just, in a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, you'll be changed. And you're standing here looking at yourself. You've you got your glorified body. You're glowing. And then these angels will gather together. So they're going to lift us up and carry us up there and be together with them. So if you die, you'll wake up in the clouds, apparently. And if you're still alive, walking down the street, the trumpet sounds, you'll look up. Every eye will see him. You'll see Jesus. And you'll see a host of people that's been resurrected. And before you maybe even figure out what's going on, suddenly you're changed. It may take a few seconds, but you'll realize, hey, I'm going up with them. And don't worry if you don't know how to fly. The angels will be sent to gather together his elect. And you are the elect. So verse 15 is the last trumpet when the dead are judged. So we know now that the dead don't rise until the last trumpet. Well, when is the rapture? When the dead rise. The rapture occurs on the same day that the dead are raised. And when is that? Well, just to make sure you understand, you don't need to turn to these familiar scriptures, but I'm going to read to you two scriptures that Paul wrote, and I wish people would understand them. <laughs> Thank God we understand, and I'll tell you why. It's not because we're so smart. It's because the Holy Spirit has opened up our mind. God calls you to an understanding. Some people don't accept the call. Many are called, few are chosen. Verse 16 of 1 Thessalonians 4, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, and the trump, that's the Greek word trumpet, of God. What trumpet will that be? And the dead will rise, and then we who are alive will be called up together. What trumpet is that? Let me back up to 1 Corinthians. I read this to you the other day, but I'm going to read it one more time. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. As long as you're a human being, you'll never make it into God's kingdom. Because if you did try to meet Jesus in the clouds, you can't fly. Try it. You can't do it. Some people think, well, maybe we'll be taken to the third heaven. You'll die before you get through outer space. It'll kill you. There'll probably be a lot of people that try. <laughs> maybe some that will. <clears throat> but you have to get a glorified body. Verse 50, if as long as you're flesh and blood, you cannot inherit the kingdom. So you're going to get a glorified body. Now, verse 51, I show you a mystery. Not everybody's going to sleep. If you're still living when Jesus comes back, you don't have to cash in your insurance policy. But all of us will be changed, living and dead. In a moment that trying to come an eye, the last trumpet. Now, he tells us the rapture occurs from the trumpet sounds, but he doesn't say which trumpet in Thessalonians. Here he tells us the very last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and what happens? The dead will be raised. We just found out what trumpet that is. It's the last trumpet. How many are there? Seven trumpets. There are seven seals on Revelation. I'm sorry, seven trumpets here. The seventh trumpet has the last place. But before that happens, when the trumpet sounds, the dead are raised and we're raptured. The last trumpet. That's what he said, last trumpet. How can there be a rapture way back here before the tribulation even starts? The rapture won't occur until the dead are raised. They don't get raised till the trumpet sounds. Yes, sir. They may think that's the real Christ. 
And that man will do so many signs and wonders, he and the false prophet. Jesus said that if possible, even the elect, that's us. That's all those people out there who are, we believe in a pre-trib rapture. Even the elect can be deceived. I mean, I, Jack Van Impey made this statement, and I heard Perry Stone say the same thing. It was impossible. I'm not quoting it exactly the way he said it, but he said, you know, the Bible says that, that uh, every eye will see Jesus, but how could everybody see Jesus except through television? Let me tell you who they will see on television. The Antichrist. Right. CNN and and, and ABC, CBS, all of them will say, look at this guy in Jerusalem doing miracles. Yep, that's what the Bible and Jack Benny and Pink and all these other false prophets will be all over television shouting about it, trumpeting the yeah. Antichrist. See, we told you we were right. Yeah. <laughs> They'll be leading <laughs> the charge. Right. Yeah. Hey, but the thing about it is, when that second trumpet sounds, they're going to know that he ain't the Christ. Right. Eventually, they're going to well, find out. Why let all this stuff happen if he was the Christ, you know? Yeah, that's where, where things get back. We get in hell. When he shows up, the great tribulation falls shortly that's thereafter. Right. We're not in hell. We catch in hell. And then when the tribulation they'll, they'll come, say, "Hey, wait a minute! How come we're not caught that's up? Right. We're not caught up. We're still here." Duh! I've been telling you for all these years on radio, the rapture does not occur until after the tribulation, right. and after the heavenly signs, and at the very end of the day of the Lord. All right, so here's what he says. At the last trumpet, the dead will be raised and then will be changed. So the rapture occurs when the dead are raised. All right, that's my introduction today. Let's get into the sermon now. <laughs> okay, so let's go back to Revelation here. Well, you're already in Revelation. Um, re okay, I'll take a real quick question. Could the elect be the covenant people, the Jews? No. In the old covenant, they were the elect. That's the only, the only elect that God had that he had at that time. But in but in the last days, the elect refers, Romans chapter 11, verse 7 says, the Christians are the elect, not the Jew. The one that followed the laws and the statutes and the commandments yeah. is the elect. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, that's right. Now, in uh, chapter 11, we have the seventh trumpet. Now, chapters 12, 13, and 14 are parenthetical or inset chapters. Now, chapter 15 continues the story. Chapter 15, verse 1 this is during the seventh trumpet. I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Filled up, if you look in the margin, it says completed. This will be the completion of God's wrath. Now, the tribulation is Satan's wrath. The, the day of the Lord is God's wrath. I won't read all that, but verse 6, the seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plagues. Now, chapter 16, it's a bowl. It's not a little glass. It's a bowl of wrath. The King James says vile, but if you look in the margin of your Bible, beside the word vile, there's a letter there, and in the margin it says L-I-T period, meaning literal, the word is bold, and I've seen it in the Greek too. So he, so ver, the first bowl of wrath, verse 2, tells what's going to happen. Sores on people, grievous, noisome sores. They still don't repent. Verse 3, the second angel poured out his bowl upon the sea, and it became uh, as blood, and every living soul, all the fish, died in the sea. They still don't repent. Verse 4, the third angel poured out his bowl upon the rivers and fountains, but they still not repenting. Verse 8, the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. Now, we've been having some pretty hot weather here, 90s in September. This is the end of September, and the 90s are going to continue through the first week of October. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when this is poured out on the sun? Yes, sir. they got snow and orange in the forest. Yeah. Strange. Right now. The men were scorched with great heat. And what do they do? Do they repent? Verse 9, they blasphemed the name of God and repented not. The last line of verse 9. They still don't repent. So the fifth bowl of wrath, verse 10, is poured out. And this time it's poured out on the very seat of the beast. And his kingdom was full of darkness. They gnawed their tongues for pain. And they continued, verse 11, to do what? They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains, but they didn't repent of their deeds. The sixth angel, verse 12, pours out his wrath so that the way, uh, pours out the, his bowl of wrath, and the waters thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of these might be prepared. Well, why is that so bad? Because this is going to be a giant battle called Armageddon. Verse 16, they gathered them together in a place in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Armageddon does not happen during the tribulation. Armageddon's not going to start next week. Armageddon happens in the seventh seal, and the seventh trumpet at the seventh 
uh, last plague because number six dries up the water. And then the very last time is when you have Armageddon. So verse 17, the seventh angel, the very last one, poured out his vial or bowl into the air. And God said, it is done. Verse 18, there was a great earthquake such as was not since men walked upon the earth. That's going to knock away the islands. That's going to be bad. The great city was divided in three parts. The cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came to remembrance. God is not going to allow apostate Christendom to escape his wrath. Verse 20, every island fled away. Don't be living in Hawaii. And the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. I used to have that written down, how much a talent is. It's pretty strong. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail. The plague of the hail. And chapters 17 and 18 talks about God's wrath upon Babylon. And chapter 18, verse 4, God says, Come out of her, my people. Apostate Christendom is Babylon. The mother church, the Roman Catholic church, is the whore that sits on the beast, sits on the Roman Empire. And then she's got daughters that came out of her, and they're called harlots in verse 5. If you pay your tithes to these to these uh, churches that are saying the law is done away. Every church that, that says Sunday is the Lord's day, they're saying the Sabbath is done away. And, and James says if you offend in one, you're guilty of all. So they're not coming, keeping God's commandments. Now, I'm not talking ugly about them. I'm just saying that, that, that like I heard Creflo Dollar recently say, he said that the Christian has no relationship to the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments don't apply to you and me. In fact, I've heard him actually say that, and I've got it on tape. I'll bring it here sometime, but here. He said, uh, not tape, but... Uh, DVD. Um, he said he read uh, 2 Corinthians 3 and totally misunderstood it. And he said the Ten Commandments have been abolished and done away. Not the rituals, the Ten Commandments. And Romans 4.15 says if the, there's no law, there's no sin. So chapter 17 and 18 is God's wrath on this apostate Christian system in the last days. Now we go to chapter 19. I know I'm holding you a little bit over time. But this is, I'm coming to the conclusion here. Do we have any more questions on there? Mm, just a comment that said this is a wonderful explanation of the seven plagues. Good, good. Seven trumpet plagues. Good. Mm. Now, chapter 19 deals again with the second coming. I want to explain something. I was asked this just the other night. Somebody asked me, one of the students asked me about why are there two explanations of Adam. You know, Adam was created, then it tells you again he was created again. Why does it mention it twice? The first time it says on the sixth day God made man. Okay, period. But then after that God goes and he backs up and goes into great detail. Well, I took him out of the dust of the earth and I formed him and I breathed in his nostrils. We have two, two explanations of the second coming of Jesus in Revelation. So in the first book, Genesis, we have two explanations of the creation of the first Adam. In Revelation, we have two explanations of the second coming of the second Adam. Do you understand? So chapter 11, beginning in verse 15, the seventh trumpet sounds and says, Jesus is coming back, dead will be raised. Okay. But now chapter 19, we get a little more information. And I saw verse 11, heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat on it was faithful and true. This is not the Antichrist. And in righteousness, he does judge and notice what he does. He makes war. Jesus is not coming back as a carpenter. He's coming back as a soldier to make war. As a king, his eyes were a flame of fire. He's called, verse 13, the word of God. And verse 15, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. Now that guy on that first white horse, he had a bow. Jesus has a sword. And with it, he should do what? Smite the nations. Today, Christ through the Holy Spirit is preaching to the nations. The Bible says, Jesus said this, the gospel will go into all nations before the time of the end. And then the end will come. That's Matthew 24, 14. But when he comes back, he's not coming back to preach. He's coming back to smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Iron rule. He treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And his name was called, verse 16, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We know who he's talking about. Jesus. I thought he was meek and mild. There's a hymn, an old hymn in the Baptist a hymnal called Jesus Meek and Mild. Well, he was the first time, but when he comes back, he's not going to be very mild. How many people do this? Would you call them mild? So we're told that he's coming back 
And then, and then uh, verse 17, this angel says, Come, he's telling the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together to the supper of the great God. Not the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is the supper for birds that you may eat, talking to the vultures, that you may eat the flesh of kings, captains, mighty men, even the flesh of horses, and them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, free and bond, small and great. This is going to be a mighty supper. You read about it in Ezekiel 38 and 39, when Russia, Libya, Ethiopia, and Iran are allied together to come down and fight Christ. And Ezekiel says it's going to take seven months to bury the bodies. Now, they can't do it all. If they're still burying bodies in seven months, what does that mean? Those bodies are laying out there for seven, for half a year. I mean, we start burying them here, and, and a month later, there's still six more months of bodies. What's happening? The vultures are having a supper. they got to wade through the blood first. Yeah. The vultures are eating all these corpses. And finally, at the end of seven months, we've got all... All the bodies buried. It's going to take that long. Half a year to bury the bodies. Do you understand when Jesus says he's coming back to smite those who disobey? Do you understand he means business? Do you want him to be mad at you when he comes back? Can you imagine the blood being up there on the bridle? Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. That's in Revelation too. So we're looking at... You say, what's all, I'm going to have to conclude here, but what's this all about? Jesus said in uh, Luke 21, let's see if I wrote it there. Okay, yeah, I know this is a Sabbath day. I don't have it written down here, but it's Luke 21. It's on the left page, right column. You've got a Schofield. This is what Jesus said. After he mentions the heavenly signs, he makes this statement. When you see these things come to pass, begin to come to pass, lift up your heads, your redemption draws nigh. You mean we haven't been redeemed? Up yet? And, and Revelation, uh, Romans 8 says the redemption of your body. When does your body get redeemed and get a glorified body? After the heavenly signs, not at the beginning of the tribulation. It's Luke 21, 28. Yeah, Luke 21, 28. Thank you. So Jesus said, when you see these things, he didn't say look down from heaven because you've been raptured. He says, look up because you're still on this earth. Look up. Your redemption's getting close. After the tribulation, after the heavenly signs are over, he said, now get ready. Your redemption is drawing nigh. Well, now what do we got to wait on? The great and terrible day of the Lord. I didn't read this in Isaiah. I forget what chapter it's in. It's on the right page, right column. But it says, it says, hide yourself till the indignation be overpassed. You want to hide. And God will protect you during the tribulation. He'll protect you during the heavenly signs. That's going to scare the daylights out, people. He's going to protect you during the great and terrible day of the Lord. But you're going to have to hide. Don't stand there stupid like say, rapture me, rapture me. No, you got to go hide, and God will protect you. But your redemption draws nigh when you see these things come to pass. Now, let me tell you what you have to see, and i got to let you go. Number one, the first thing to look for is the building of the temple, and they're ready now. It hadn't started yet, but they are now totally ready. The priests have been checked. they got their garments here recently, all their vestments. they got all the temple furniture. Everything's ready to go. And two weeks from now, Gershon Solomon and his group, and I've met him, I've interviewed him, He's told, he told me personally, he said, we're going to build that temple. And two weeks from now, they're going to drive. Uh, 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 they've got a cart that they carry. The, they've got two cornerstones for the temple. They're going to drive that cart with those stones around the temple mount. Makes the Arabs mad every year they do that. <laughs> two weeks from now, they're going to do that. And they're going to proclaim, we are going to build the temple. Now, I don't know when they're going to do it, but they're ready right now. So the first thing we look for is the temple being rebuilt. Three and a half years later, after the temple has been built, the abomination of desolation is set up. The great tribulation begins. You have the heavenly signs. Then you have the day of the Lord. You have the seven last, well, before that happens, you have the seventh trumpet. This is after the trumpet sounds. We know our redemption is getting close. So what are we to look for? Keep your eyes on Jerusalem. <coughs> We may not have but 10 more years. I don't know. Maybe we got 200 more years. Maybe there'll be another 200, 300. We got nothing to worry about. But folks, do you really think that God's going to let them get prepared to build it and never let them build it for another 100 years yet? Or even another 50 years? They're ready now. Back in 1967, I heard people say, they're going to build the temple. But they weren't ready. It took them decades. They had to train the priests. They had to get the, all the furniture together. 
they're now ready. So how long do we have? Jesus said, when well, you see all this happen now, lift up your eyes. Why? Because our redemption's coming from heaven. Yes, ma'am. been yeah. about 40 years since 67 right now. Yeah, actually 50 years. Yeah. 50 years <clears throat> and see, it took them half a century to get everything ready. Like two years ago, I think it was, they said we're now, everything's ready. There's nothing yet to do. A talent of weight in pounds, approximately 70 pounds. Is it? Okay, it's pretty, those are pretty big hailstones. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, <clears throat> I don't want to keep you any longer. I'm sorry I held you a little bit over time, but folks, this is a holy day. Let me say this and I'm going to shut up. Why does God say, I want you to get together every year and, and, and keep a, a feast and take off from work and come to church on this holy day? God doesn't want us to forget the meaning of this holy day. He doesn't want us to forget. You know what the church world is doing? They forgot these holy days. What are they doing right now? The stores, they got the costumes out. They got the Halloween candy. They're getting ready for Satan's chief holiday. Now, that's not my interpretation. I heard a Satanist say this on television. He said... Our chief holy day is Halloween. And he was a Satanist. Why are the Christians celebrating it? Because they won't celebrate the days God gave them because they've been misled by false teachers who say the law was done away. God says, you keep this every year. Don't forget I'm coming back and don't forget all what I've taught you today. People that don't keep the holy days will say, well, you know, the rapture will come any moment because they don't keep the holy days. Are there any questions? Do other countries celebrate Halloween like we do, like no. people do here in the United States? I don't know. I, in Europe, it started in Europe, so they probably still do it in Europe. All the Catholics, it's on the Catholic calendar. I've seen it on the Catholic calendar. It's listed as a Christian holiday. Any questions? Now, 10 days from now, today, inclusive, the 10th day of this month will be the Day of Atonement. That will be on our 9th of October this year. And we're going to have a day of fasting that day. Now you say, oh, fasting, I hate to fast. Well, God tells us, you can go ahead and read it after verse 25 there in Leviticus 23. Go ahead and read where it talks about the day of atonement. And uh, Acts 27 verse 9 says it mentions the fast. They were still doing it in the book of Acts. So we're going, I know you don't like to fast. Listen, I don't want to fast any more than anybody the rest of you do. He says afflict yourself. And when you go without breakfast, that's an affliction. And just imagine when you have to get up and preach and without breakfast. You talk about an affliction and no coffee. Going out. Start on the eighth and the on the ninth. Yeah, it, it, sundown. What did you say? You said going without coffee is the worst affliction. Going without coffee, yeah. So, so that we'll be here for that holy day. I want all of you to, to be here for that day. And I'm going to explain the meaning of of the Day of Atonement. Don't ask a Jew. They don't know. Don't ask. They, they think this is New Year's Day. They don't know it's the second coming of Jesus. They don't know he's coming the first time. And then five days after that is the, is the Feast of Tabernacles, and that's beautiful. And that'll be on a Monday also. Any questions? Well, sorry to hold you over time. Thank you for being here. Uh, but we only do the trumpets once a year, so 15 minutes over time won't kill us. Amen. Hey, it's good to see everybody here. Wendy and Harrison, good to see you again. And uh, good to have everybody here. We'll see you all. We're dismissed.